and we want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. We want to say a very special welcome to Barbara Jordan, Bethune, Arcadia Park, Julius Dorsey, Seagullville, Marcella Steen, Steen, and Burnett from Dallas ISD and Rosa Parks Millbrook from Lancaster ISD. Pictures, if you're watching, you have not registered, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register and sign up. This is just for our attendance records only. Program today will be life cycles of insects. During this virtual field trip, students will investigate some of the unique stages that insects, such as grasshoppers and butterflies, undergo during their life cycle. Ms. Fuller will talk about the life cycle of a dragonfly. Ms. Ramirez, the life cycle of a darkling beetle. Ms. Nash will discuss the life cycle of a butterfly. And Mr. Monroe will tell you all about the life cycle of a beetle. Uh, there will be no verbal questions during this program, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC space question space answer and send in a question. And I will either answer them during the program or send the answers to your teacher and they can discuss them with you. Now I am going to stop sharing my screen. And Ms. Fuller is going to tell you all about the life cycle of a dragonfly. Hello, boys and girls. I'm going to talk to you about dragonflies. And their um, life cycle is different from the one of a, a beetle or a, um, a butterfly. So let's get started and look at this on a PowerPoint. I'm going to share my screen with you and show you this very interesting animal. Now, the first thing that we need to talk about before we do anything else is never ever capture a dragonfly, never ever kill one. They are what are called beneficial insects. They are help us. They eat lots and lots of um, things that bother us like yellow jackets and flies and mosquitoes. So never eat one, they're our friends. So they undergo a type of life cycle called incomplete metamorphosis, which means they don't go through the pupil stage. Now, the three that you see on this picture here, these are all adult stages. So let's go and look at a few essential questions as we go through our PowerPoint. Number one, what do we call the type of metamorphosis that dragonflies go through? And number two, how long do dragonfly nymphs stay in the water. We've got two more adult dragonflies. Dragonflies are very beautiful. They're not as pretty as butterflies, but almost they are really gorgeous. Now I made a little video of our a small pond, did this yesterday morning. And you see, we've got a lot of egrets out there right now because of all the water. I made this little video to show you, this is the kind of environment habitat that we would find dragonflies. The nymph stage, uh, they, they're considered aquatic insects and they live in the water. And then the dragonflies themselves fly around above the water, capturing and eating mosquitoes and flies and all those other guys that we don't particularly care for. Now, if you'll look in the very middle of the pond, now that I've moved off it right there, that's a bathhouse. Bats also eat lots and lots of insects. So they're very beneficial as well. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between complete metamorphosis and incomplete metamorphosis. Dragonflies undergo incomplete metamorphosis where there is no pupa stage and the nymph looks like the adult. Now over on the left is complete metamorphosis. When you studied the butterfly, when you were in the second grade, you learned that the butterfly started as an egg and then a larva and then a pupa and then an adult. And each of the four stages looked different from the other. In incomplete metamorphosis, they start in an egg and when they hatch out, they're called a prolarva. But that stage just lasts just very brief time and then they become what's known as a nymph. And they spend most of their life 
as a nymph. They live in the water and they can live there anywhere from months to, to two years. So they live the significant um, larger part of their life in the water. That's why they're considered lar uh, they're considered aquatic insects. And then finally, they crawl out, crawl on a stem of some plant and emerge as an adult dragonfly. Now, dragonfly nymphs hatch from eggs that are in the water and they live most of their lives as nymphs, anywhere from months to two years. They molt several times. While they, they're very, very hungry. And of course, the more they eat, the larger they grow. And then the exoskeleton splits up and they crawl out and harden a new one. They can, they can molt from one size to another as many as 14 times. Now the, uh, if, now the one on the far right, he might be a little on the immature side, but as he gets bigger, you'll see their bodies look more and more like the adult dragonfly. So this is like grasshoppers. Grasshoppers don't go through that egg, larva, pupil, adult thing. They have nymphs and they, they're not aquatic. They don't live in the water, but the nymph looks just like the adult, only tiny. Now the emergent dragonfly is when the nymph emerges, comes out, of the old a nymph exoskeleton and becomes the adult butterfly. I've got two pictures here of nymphs coming out of the exoskeleton. The guy on the left is just emerging. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what I need to tell you is they don't come out all in one fell swoop. They come out partially because their legs, they have six legs, they're insects. The, the legs have to get strong and they have to dry out because they have to be able to support the weight of the whole body. When they first come out, they can't do that. Their, their legs are too weak, <coughs> excuse me. So the guy over there on the left is just beginning to come out. His head and his torso emerge with his weak legs. He waits till they get strong. And then you see the guy over on the right, and this is a, a dragonfly that is completely emerged from the nymph, but the wings haven't dried yet. I've got a little uh, video I'm going to show you. It's set to music, and uh, let me progress it a little bit. And you're going to see uh, as he comes out, there's his torso and his head. Now look at his legs. They're too weak to support him. So he's trying to wait until those six legs get strong, they dry out, they get hard. So that when he pulls his abdomen out of the, uh, ex the nymph exoskeleton, he can support the weight of his body. And he's gonna do that in just a minute. He's gonna curl up and remove the abdomen from that. Uh, there he goes, you see that? There he goes. Now, there, now he's holding on with those weak legs, but they're not as weak as they were. This, this is a time-lapse of photography. This takes hours and hours to do. And look what's happening next. He's, his wings are starting to unfold and they're starting to get strong. Remember, he can't, he can't fly until everything has uh, unfolded and gotten hard and um, it can support his, his body. So let's go ahead. I'm going to put it to the end where he gets released. The man who videotaped this is going to release him. Maybe. Isn't he gorgeous? That's a beautiful dragonfly. We waited five hours. Now it's the wings are completely unfolded, completely dry, and he's gonna return it to nature. So there we go. A beautiful video of a beautiful event. Now I'm gonna get out of that and go to the next one. Now, what do dragonflies eat? In these two pictures, the one on the left shows you a dragonfly eating a yellow jacket. 
go dragonfly. And the one on the right shows a dragonfly eating a fly. Go dragonfly. Uh, I don't care for either one of those other insects. Now here's a challenge for you. Do a computer search on Texas dragonflies. Texas has 160 different kinds of dragonflies. Find three, that's all. Just find three that you really like, draw them and color them and give the drawings to your teacher. Remember, never capture or kill a dragonfly. They are our friends. Look at the, the three guys that they eat, mosquito, yellow jacket and flies. I'm gonna get out of our screen right here. Stop sharing. And I'm gonna turn you over to Dr. Gorman and he's gonna answer any questions that you have about dragonflies or um, incomplete metamorphosis. Thanks so much, bye-bye. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. Uh, question, how many dragonflies, I mean, how many mosquitoes will a dragonfly eat in a day? Okay, dragonflies, which eat insects as adults, are a great control on the mosquito population. A single dragonfly can eat 30 to hundreds of mosquitoes per day. Good job. Okay, and now Mr. Maris is going to discuss darkling beetles. Hello, my name is Mr. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about the life cycle of a darkling beetle. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to share my iPad screen with you guys, and we're going to look at the habitat of my darkling beetles. It might take just a second for me to get my uh, screen share going through the iPad. So while we're waiting, think about what do you think a darkling beetle looks like, and also think about how do you think it changes as it grows up? So let me go ahead and pull up our camera and we'll make our way over to our habitat over here. So this is where the darkling beetles live. So make some observations about what you guys are seeing. And I'm gonna move over here because I already spot some darkling beetles. So they get that name darkling beetle because they look rather dark in color. These are the adults. They are insects because they have two legs, or sorry, they have two antenna and they have six legs. So insects have six legs and two antenna on their heads. And it, the female adults will reproduce and they will lay eggs. Now it's super hard to find eggs because they are really tiny. So we're not gonna be able to see any eggs today, but out of those eggs will actually hatch the larva. So I'm gonna dig around and see if we can find some larva somewhere. And I thought I saw some in here. So let's pull that back. Uh, so here we have some larva. Another name for the larva of this beetle is called a meal worm. And they get that name because they kind of look like a worm, um, but it's not technically a worm. So it's still an insect. It does have six legs, so if you ever get a chance to pick one of these up and take a look at it and observe it, you'll see it does have six legs uh, near its head. Uh, so it's not a worm, it's an insect. And as soon as the mealworm hatches out of the egg, it's gonna be super tiny. And when it hatches, it's gonna be really tiny and every time it grows, it's gonna shed its skin and get bigger and bigger. And this is about the typical a big size that it will reach. Now, once the mealworm or larva reaches this size and it's gotten the nutrients that it needs, it's going to slow down its body functions and it's gonna to start to go into a resting stage called the pupa. So we had some pupa over here earlier, so let's see if they are still there. So here's the pupa stage. They don't look that interesting. They're not really doing much. They're kind of white in color and don't really move. The pupa is what we call the resting stage. And even though they're not really doing much, inside that pupa, their body is starting to change or transform to prepare it for the last stage, the adult stage. Now this pupa, notice how it's different than the other ones. This pupa is actually moving, it's darker, and we can actually start to make out some of the legs, the eyes, and the antenna. That lets me know that this pupa is getting ready to turn into an adult. Uh, so that's pretty cool. It's getting ready to transform. Now, after the pupa stage, of course, we have the adult stage. So we have the egg, which we can't see right now, 
uh, but we have the larva comes next. After the larva, we have the pupa. And after the pupa, we have the adult. Now it's important to learn about these stages because we actually have animals here at the environmental center that love to eat these things for food. So I'm gonna show you guys Spike and he is a bearded dragon lizard. He's been camera shy lately, so I don't know if he's gonna to wanna to eat for us, but I'll put some in front of him and we'll see what he does. He loves to eat mealworms. They're like his favorite treat. We'll see if he'll eat. If he's not hungry, that's okay too. At least you got to see him. So there's Spike, the bearded dragon. He's an omnivore, so he eats meat like other insects, but he'll also eat fruits and veggies. I don't think he's gonna eat for us this round, but that's okay. So there is Spike the bearded dragon. So I'm gonna go ahead and move us back to our uh, presentation on our laptop. So I'm gonna stop my iPad screen share. So let me stop that and let me pull up my video for you guys. So let me start my screen share for the computer. And I have a couple of essential questions for you guys. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is, what do we call the type of metamorphosis that darkling beetles go through? And the second is, is a mealworm an insect or a worm? And you should be able to explain that. Uh, so keep those questions in mind as we go through the presentation. And we learned earlier that it's important to learn about uh, mealworms and beetles because animals use them for food. But not only do things like chickens and spiders and bearded dragons, but also people too. So around the world, uh, people actually eat mealworms for food. It's a good source of protein. In our next slide, we have a diagram that explains those stages that you guys saw in my beetle box. Um, so it starts off as an egg. Now again, that egg was super tiny. Out of that egg is gonna hatch the larva. Again, for this beetle, the larva is also called the mealworm. Now the larva, again, is gonna be super tiny when it first hatches, but it will eventually grow bigger and bigger. And the way it does that is every time it grows, it will actually shed or lose its exoskeleton. The exoskeleton is sort of like a hard outer covering, sort of like a skin. Um, so it will actually shed that exoskeleton and then it will go bigger, grow bigger and bigger every time it sheds its skin. Eventually that larva will start to slow down its bodily functions. It'll get really kind of lazy like. Um, it'll crawl into that little white ball that you guys saw earlier called the pupa. The pupa doesn't move around a lot, but inside that pupa, its body is starting to change so that it can prepare itself for the final stage, the adult. And again, we saw the adult, they were very active, crawling around, moving around, looking for food and water and resources. And it's the adult females that will then mate and then lay the eggs. And then the whole cycle will start over again with a new generation of beetles. Now notice how many stages are in this cycle. There are four stages. Because this uh, beetle has four stages, it has a complete metamorphosis. So metamorphosis is just a life cycle change. And it just shows us how an organism changes as it grows. And again, because this has four stages to it, it is complete metamorphosis. So let's take a quick look at a video of a mealworm, also called a larva, turning into a pupa. Now this is a time-lapse video, so it's gonna go by rather fast. Uh, but you can see here's the larva. It's getting ready to push out its old exoskeleton. And then we see the pupa emerging. Now when that pupa first emerges or comes out, um, it's going to be rather white or pale in color. It will start to get darker as it gets closer to turning into the actual beetle. But you, if you look really closely, you might even be able to make out some of those beetle features, some of the legs and the antenna and the eyes. And you can see it's taking quite a while for that pupa to finally push off all that old skin or exoskeleton. And hopefully you guys noticed in my beetle habitat, you saw lots of these left behind exoskeletons or skins. So there's the pupa. 
In our next video, we're going to take a look at the pupa turning into the adult. Again, it's also going to be time lapse, so it's going to happen a lot faster than it would in real life. As that pupa gets ready to turn to an adult, it's going to get darker, and that's how you know when they're almost turning. So look how much darker this pupa is. Also, you can make out some features. You can see what's going to be the legs, the antenna, and the eyes. And that pupa is going to start to push off that old exoskeleton, that old skin. It's going to start to push it off, and then the adult beetle will be able to finally emerge from that pupa. And just like that pupa was white and pale when it first emerged, the adult beetle is also going to be rather white and pale when it first emerges. It's probably going to take a few days uh, for it to get the typical black or brown color that you guys saw in my beetle habitat. So there he is. He finally got all that old skin off and he is an adult. And then my next slide, I have a quick challenge for you guys. It is a beetle scavenger hunt. So go outside and see if you can find an adult beetle, a larva, or even a pupa. And then with the help of an adult, take a picture of it or draw and color it and see if you can identify what type of beetle it is. And a good website is bugguide.net. It has lots of great pictures for you guys to help you find out what you discovered. And some good examples of beetles that you guys are probably familiar with would be things like the ladybug, also the June bugs that we're gonna start to see since it's getting closer to summer, those big brown uh, beetles that are attracted to the lights. Um, also things like the lightning bugs, which I started seeing too. Those are all different beetles. And then if you go outside and you lift up a rock or a tree stump, you might see some grubs. A grub is also another name for the larva stage of some beetles. So that's something cool too. So see what you can find outside. So I'm going to stop my screen share and I do want to show you guys something cool that I found. These are called larvets. Uh, they are mealworms that are fit for human consumption. So these are mealworms that we can eat. They've actually been cooked in air dry. Um, uh, not air, air fried, there you go. They've been fried and uh, they actually taste rather interesting. So the ones that I've been snacking on are the Mexican spice uh, larva or mealworms. And I'll show you guys what they look like. They kind of taste to me like a Frito chip, uh, but they are rather crunchy um, and they have a very interesting flavor too. So if you're ever out and about and you actually see these, um, go ahead and give them a try. But that's just important to note because people around the world actually eat insects for food. It is good protein. Uh, so that's all I have for you guys today on mealworm or darkling beetle metamorphosis. We're gonna give that back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. I doubt that you'll be getting many calls for the woman to know the address where those students can order those larva so they can eat them, okay? Are darkling beetles dangerous to humans? No, they are completely harmless. They won't bite you unless you just really irritate them and then it won't hurt very much and they do not spread disease. So no, they are not harmful or dangerous to humans. And now Miss Nash is gonna to talk to us all about beautiful butterflies. Hello, welcome to my classroom. Today we're talking about everyone's favorite insect, the butterfly. And they're out now, maybe flying around, you can see some drinking nectar on all the spring flowers. So they're really interesting and, and we're gonna look at some pictures and talk about them. Let's look at a few pictures and then we'll look at some other things. Here we go. So the butterfly, just like the beetle, undergoes what we call complete metamorphosis. And that big word metamorphosis means great big change. And in fact, they've undergone tremendous changes over the course of their life cycle. Starting as a tiny egg, okay, you can see how tiny they are on this leaf. Okay. A tiny larva comes out and eats and eats, and they're just eating machines. They will eat and eat, and they're uh, molt, okay, 
change the exoskeleton until they're big enough. When they're big enough, they're going to pupate. They're going to stop moving around and they're going to form what we call a, a pupa or a chrysalis in the case of a butterfly, a cocoon or some moss. And then out of that chrysalis comes the adult. And then the adult are going to mate and the female will lay eggs and the whole cycle will begin again. So here's a picture of that tiny monarch egg on a leaf. And here's that hungry, hungry caterpillar. And they're eating one kind of plant. One interesting thing about butterflies is that most of them have one kind and only one kind or a family of plants that they lay eggs on. Okay. And the caterpillars eat that. So this one is eating a plant called milkweed that is toxic okay, to most animals. But the monarch butterfly can eat it, and then the caterpillar is toxic. If a bird eats it, they get sick, and then they remember not to eat it again. And the adults are also toxic. That's why they have these colors. See the, the yellow, green, and black stripes? That tells birds, don't eat me, you'll be sorry. And here's that beautiful chrysalis, and out of that chrysalis is going to come this amazing big butterfly. Again, the bright colors tell birds, don't eat me. So we have a lot of butterflies around. They're, fairly, they're really common. One well, of the most common is this little, little one, not too bright, kind of brownish, but they're called the hackberry butterfly, and they're kind of medium-sized, not, not gigantic. But they eat the hackberry leaves as larva. Here are those eggs on a hackberry leaf, and here's the larva. Notice that it's not brightly colored. It's camouflaged. It's a green like the leaf. Because the hackberry leaf is not toxic. In fact, apparently delicious because my dog likes to eat them, and, a horse will, and horses and goats love them. So this caterpillar has to be camouflaged. Here's another really interesting one that you'll see around, the giant swallowtail. Look at that, it's our biggest butterfly, big as their hand. It's got that yellow stripe across the, going back and forth, okay, horizontal. Okay, the swallowtail, see the tail here on the hind wing. But the, and it lays its eggs on the prickly ash tree. And the caterpillars, when they're little, they look like a bird dropping. Okay. So they have a really interesting way of protecting themselves from being eaten by birds. They look like a bird dropping, and no one wants to eat that. As they get bigger, they kind of change color and begin to look more like a branch of the tree. And finally, here's the chrysalis. Look, it's holding they bring a little string there to hold themselves up. And then look how much it looks like the bark of that branch. Isn't that amazing? And then the, the adult. Here's another one I have a lot of in my guard. These uh, pipe vine swallowtail. Again, a swallowtail, a pretty big one, bright blue and with orange underneath. Again, a warning. And the caterpillar has these orange spots on it to warn the, butter, the big birds, don't eat me. Again, the leaf is slightly toxic. Okay. And here's that chrysalis, again, camouflaged. Now the butterfly, the adults don't ever eat. They only drink, they drink nectar. And flowers make nectar. And the butterfly comes for the nectar, they get pollen from the flower stuck on their body. Here's the pollen, see it right there. It might get stuck on their body, they go to another flower and they take the pollen and the flower can then be pollinated to make seeds and then grow more plants. So the plant gets pollinated and the butterflies get the nectar they need. It's a painted lady, the red admiral, you'll see a lot of these around. Here's our tiger swallows with the stripes going up and down. And the funny one I like, the snout butterfly. Isn't that funny? So here in this part of Texas, we have two kinds of milkweed that grow on the sides of the road in the fields if they don't mow them all down. Poor monarchs come looking for them and they mow them all down. But the antelope horn and the green milkweed 
And in my yard, I have the pipe vine. They call it the pipe vine because it's this weird pipe, pipe shaped flower, really weird flower. But the, the larva will eat this plant down to the ground and it will grow back again. It's amazing. Here's our hackberry, that weird bumpy bark. You can find them all around. They're really common tree. And see how they've already been chewed on a little bit. Okay. So really a good tree for caterpillars. And here's the prickly ash. And they have this amazing bark and you can recognize them also by the bark of the stem. I was raising some caterpillars last week. <laughs> and on Friday, before I went home for the weekend, I gave them a bunch of food and I said, good luck guys. See you on Monday. But on Monday I came in and where are my caterpillars? Uh-oh. They all, they ate all the food up that I left for them. And then they pupated. Okay, so they all crawled up to the top of the little cage here and made their pupate, made their chrysalis. So we're waiting. So maybe a few more days, they'll start coming out and become butterflies and set them free so they can go find some nectar. So butterflies are a fun thing to observe and try to identify. So a really easy one to identify is our monarch. The bright colors tell us, I have my monarch. But another interesting thing is we have other butterflies that look similar, okay? Because they're mimicking. Okay, to mimic. And birds don't eat this one either, okay. even though it might be delicious. Okay. A really interesting adaptation. Here's another one you might see around. And they open their wings up, they're bright colors, orange is usually. And then when they close their wing, look what they look like. That's a butterfly, but it looks like a dead leaf, even down to the veins. Isn't that amazing? What an amazing adaptation that is. Here's another really interesting way to protect yourself. Look like a snake, even though you're just a caterpillar. So these are not really eyes, okay? They're just spots on the head. Isn't that interesting? So it looks scary like a snake. And the adult also has those scary eyes, okay? And here's one that looks like a bumblebee. So all kinds of interesting ways to protect yourself if you're small and likely to be eaten. So I encourage you to go outside to the garden, the park, the schoolyard, the neighborhood, and walk around. If you have a hand lens, take that with you, and you can observe some butterflies. Please don't catch them because it damages their wings and then they can't fly. So just look at them, watch and see if you can see them drinking their nectar with their proboscis, the long root kind of tongue that goes down in the flower. See if you can figure out which flowers they like best. They do like some better than others. And then if you're lucky, you might see them laying some eggs. You can also go around and look for some leaves that have been chewed on by caterpillars. And then you might find the caterpillar. I went out and looked for caterpillars. All I found were these leaves. And they had been really, really hungry. Look at that one. They ate almost every yummy bit off that leaf. So lots of fun things to look at. Sometimes you can even see the little bite marks okay, on the leaf from that hungry, hungry caterpillar. If you have any questions about butterflies, you can ask Dr. Brunner. Thank you so much, Ms. Nash. And we did have a question. What is the world's smallest butterfly? Uh, it's commonly believed that the Western pygmy blue butterfly is the world's smallest. It has a wingspan of one half inch and uh, it is known as the smallest butterfly in the world. And Mr. Monroe is gonna tell you all about the life cycle of beetles. Good afternoon, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're gonna be looking at uh, the life stages, developmental stages of a beetle. Now, there are a variety of beetles, and uh, you've heard Ms. Ramirez she gave you information on the darkling beetle. And uh, I tell you what, that, that's really something, her uh, consuming that mealworm like she did. But listen, I have my own favorite beetle. I don't have time to go over all the beetles that are existing in the world today. 
but I'm going to be focusing in on a member of the passivit group. And these are beetles that, hey, they live in a variety of different places. In fact, the one that I'm going to be um, teaching you a little bit about today is one that actually lives in a log home. They would find a log like this. And eventually as that log, a dead log starts going through the process of decomposition, they're gonna make their homes in it and they're gonna help that log finish up being recycled into the environment. If you were out here today, we would probably be taking a hike in the Post Oak Preserve. One of these days, we hope that you can make the trip out here to visit us. And as we walk along the nature trails over there, you might even see me go over and turn over a log similar to this, looking for this very special beetle, which is my favorite insect, that really helps the environment. Now, they go by a variety of names. And you know what, when talking about those names, you know, I became interested in this beetle long before I knew that it was a beetle. Long ago, I heard my mother use a phrase, uh, she was talking about somebody else and she was referring to that person as being as crazy as a Betsy bug. And I thought to myself, I guess I was about your age, I thought to myself, is there really a bug or beetle that goes by that name? We'll come to find out there is. The name that they're known by today, they are called best beetles. They are amazing simply because they do live in log homes and the parents often live with the offspring. So they're family oriented. They have very powerful mandibles chewing parts of their body where they chew wood, they consume wood. And as they go through their life processes, the res residual effect or their droppings actually is adding to the soil. Now, the parent best beetles will ch chew through or excavate rooms and passages in a log where the family members will stay. This is an example. We can see that there are different hollows different crevices, and these were all created by best beetles or Betsy bugs, okay? Now, students, these Betsy bugs, oh man, they are really something. They even will guard against intruders that might do harm to their families. And they also communicate. Well, we know that a lot of insects, they communicate like grasshoppers, they will rub their legs together and make these squeeching sounds. Well, the best bugs or Betsy bugs, they do the same thing. And when they get really hard up for food, they will consume their own residual leftover, their poop, okay? They may look like they're dangerous or menacing because the mandibles that they have appear to be large pinchers. And they are amazingly strong students. These little beetles can move over 20 times their own body mass. That's really something. And you know what? They've been around for a long time. The best beetles, the pastlets, guess what? They have been around for the last 25 million years. Now, Ms. Ramirez talked about the type of metamorphosis that the darkling beetle goes through. Well, the best beetle goes through the same type of metamorphosis. It is called complete metamorphosis. They start out as an egg. Let me tell you something about the egg. When that egg is there, and if the parents want to move that egg, they will take those real strong mandibles, they will grab a hold to that egg, not harming the egg, and move it to a different location if necessary. Now, the next stage from the egg is the larva stage. And the darkling beetle, yes, the larva stage was called a mealworm, right? Well, the larva stage of the best beetle or the Betsy bug is actually something called a grub worm. And you did hear Ms. Ramirez talk about that. And you know what? Something else. The parents, when the grub worm needs a little something to eat and can't find it for itself, the parents will feed the larva stage by chewing up wood and regurgitating it so that it can feed it its baby, the larva stage. 
you know, and from the larva stage, they actually move into, again, the pupa stage. Looks very similar to what Ms. Ramirez showed you, right? And then over a period of time, they will begin to come out of that. And when they shed that pupa and they come out, at first, they're kind of a reddish brown, and then eventually they turn black, just like the darkling beetle does, okay? So, very similarities, a lot of similarities there. The amazing thing about these guys, they are really family oriented. Where you find one, you are going to find a group. Now I have one I wanna show you. Whoa, all right. I'm gonna put it on a piece of wood cause that's where it's going to be very comfortable. Now I'm holding it at first and I just wanna point out the little pinchers that are right here at the front. You see those pinchers? I'll see if I can get them to open up a little bit. Now they're not gonna bite me. They're not gonna pinch my skin, but they will pinch off a piece of wood. They love to eat certain types of wood. And you can see they're very at home crawling across a piece of log. Now another common nickname that they have, they're also called a patent leather beetle. And that, that's probably because, you know, patent leather is real shiny and black. And if you look at this best beetle, look what color it's showing, a shiny black coat. How many legs? Six legs and a pair, one pair of antennas and then some very strong mandibles that is used to chew wood, okay? So there you go, guys. That's a best beetle. Now, if any of you have any questions, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gorman so he can answer those questions for you. You guys have a good day now. Yes, we do have a question, Mr. Monroe. Are any beetles dangerous to humans? There are only a few types of beetles that can bite humans. When this happens, it's usually as a result of unintentional contact between the person and the beetle. Some beetles can inflict a painful bite if threatened or provoked, but beetles do not carry or spread diseases. And now I am going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students investigated some of the unique stages that insects such as grasshoppers and butterflies undergo during their life cycle. Mrs. Fuller talked to you about the life cycle of a dragonfly. Ms. Ramirez, the life cycle of a darkling beetle. Ms. Nash discussed the life cycle of a butterfly. Mr. Monroe covered the life cycle of a beetle. Thank you, teachers. How did we do? Uh, if you would, go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback. Fill out a short form and send back to us. We would appreciate your input on our program. Thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of the day, students. But more importantly, you have a great rest of your life. Thank you again.